All right, so I think we have mostly everyone on. So I'm going to start us off. Um, we're so excited to be here today. Welcome and thank you to everyone who is on this webinar joining us today. Um, we wanted to start off by expressing our gratitude to the BU Wheelock community for having us for this opportunity. Um, as well as a special thanks to our program director um, of Child Life and Family Centered, Claire, Centered Care, Claire White, for sharing this opportunity with our team. Um, my name is Amelia, and I am a child life specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm going to let my colleagues um, here also announce themselves, and I'm also a former Wheelock grad as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Maria Vukic, a music therapist formerly at Boston Children's and now in private practice as Third Space Music Therapy. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Daphne Savage Preskins. I am also a Wheelock alum. I graduated in 1995 from the Child Life Program and have been working as a Child Life Specialist ever since. I currently work at Boston Children's in outpatient cardiology and in our cath lab. Thanks for joining us today. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren. Um, I'm also a Wheelock graduate and currently I work in the medical intensive care unit at Boston Children's. Great, so obviously why are we all here today? So I know and I hope that everyone joining this call has some sense of why we're here, given the title of our presentation that we are, you know, looking to promote equity, diversity, inclusion in everyday practice. And our presentation today hopefully will highlight the efforts that our team has made at Boston Children's Hospital to promote equity, diversity, inclusion within our hospital and our institution. We'd like to highlight and explore the importance that we have as allied health professionals in supporting and promoting um, these initiatives and supporting a diverse range of children and families in which we serve. And we hope that you will all leave this presentation with some tangible strategies on how you all can promote a more inclusive, diverse and equitable practice in your institutions and community organizations. Okay, so from the chat, we got a good sense of who's here with us today. I know we have some um, OTs, it sounds like a lot of child life specialists, and maybe some even um, Wheelock alum, faculty, and students, which is great. Um, we also wanted to share who we are and what makes up our committee. So our committee is pictured here. We have provided all of the interventions that you're going to see today. Um, and just to give you a better idea about who we're comprised of, we have child life specialists on our committee who provide psychosocial support to children and families, assisting with coping, normalization, procedures, um, and development in the hospital environment. And then we also have music therapists on our committee who work to support patients' clinical biopsychosocial goals in the family-centered context and also a media program specialist who develops interactive TV programs for patients and families in the hospital and acts as an on-air on host and facilitator during live programs in our Seacrest studio. And our Seacrest studio leads me into explaining to you that with diversity within our roles in the hospital environment, we also have diversity in our locations throughout the hospital. So one of our members, as I said, works in the Seacrest studio, which is a TV and radio studio at Boston Children's that broadcasts on Channel 19, a closed circuit television network with live interactive programming for patients and families for empowerment and entertainment. We also have child life specialists working inpatient, outpatient, and in satellites. And also we're comprised of different, different levels of leadership. So some of us hold leadership roles within our department. Most of all, what we want you to know is that we were all able to come together as a unit and figure out some goals for equity, diversity, and inclusion work. So we thought about some macro goals in the beginning, some really big picture goals that we wanted to help work towards and we might not have achieved yet, but they're still in the works. And then some micro goals, more attainable goals that we're gonna be sharing more about today. That includes staff education, some dialogue and diversifying materials. So we're gonna hop right into the presentation just to give you a little bit of an idea of what our presentation is gonna look like today. 
there are some opportunities for polls, some engagement. Um, we're gonna share our interventions that we've created at Austin Children's, and we're gonna leave time for questions at the end. So our first learning objective today is that participants will engage in self-reflection and examine biases. This is the first step, reflection, is really important to this work, just to understand who you are, how you identify, and how that fits in with the larger world um, and your workplace. So this helps us reflect on our biases, find our blind spots, and also identify um, points that we can grow in. Learning objective two is participants will recognize the importance of promoting DEI in everyday practice. So we're gonna be sharing with you some research that we've collected, our clinical responsibilities and challenges and successes that we've had in this work. Learning objective three is participants will identify tangible action items and strategies to foster a more equitable, diverse and inclusive environment for children and families. So basically that means that we want you all to walk away feeling empowered by what we share so that you can be inspired to expand that into your workplace and share kind of just what EDI work can look like on a micro or macro scale. However, you walk away today, we just hope that you take something away from this presentation. As we're starting out in this, in this uh, presentation today, we just wanted a few reminders, um, knowing that discussions on diversity, equity, inclusion can be a bit on the heavier side and on the personal side. Um, you know, every time we enter into conversations about health equity, we know we're taking a closer look at all the inequity that exists. Every time we talk about increasing inclusion, we have to look at the exclusionary practices that currently exist. And then increasing and diversifying is, is having a closer look at discrimination. So these are heavy topics and lived experiences. So just as a reminder, we want everyone to feel safe here, um, and psychologically safe with this content. So um, being able to hold this space is our job. Um, and then being able to have these kind of reminders that being here um, fully present is important, allowing everyone to have a voice. We do have a lot of audience engagement planned for today. Um, there are no bad questions or ideas. Avoiding but, but try yes and. Attack problems, not people. Active listening required. Mutual respect promotes creative thinking. And it's okay to disagree. Um, it's not okay to not speak up, um, and off-topic comments will be parked. The weeds should be avoided, and at the end of the day, unity is critical. These have been guidelines for our departmental discussions, and will be more or less useful today as well when we have group discussion. So now if you can head over to the poll with the pair deck slide. Um, we're going to have a chance for everybody to input a little bit of kind of the key words or what comes to your mind when you think of this big idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is interesting because it allows us to see people as they're typing in time. <laughs> Making our society better for all. Dismantling white supremacy. Access for all. Thinking of culture. Access, personal accountability. We have a lot of accessibility here. Mm. Openness and a willingness to recognize importance of each person. I see vulnerability as well. anti-racism we have another culture and accessibility differences opportunity for fairness but absolutely still working still a working goal action that addresses barriers allowing children to have mirrors and windows mm, that's interesting i want to hear more about that dismantling systemic racism and oppression Respect, vital to community success, culture, and opportunity 
human respect, ability to learn from others, cultural humility and cultural awareness. Beautiful. That fence graphic, <laughs> I think that maybe that equity versus equality graphic, maybe. Acceptance and respect, awareness of self, opening minds, valuing experiences, acknowledge biases, growth. Beautiful. I think we've got a <laughs> good head start to all the DEI topics currently. Thank you, everybody. That was wonderful to see all these comments. Um, there'll be more opportunities as well to kind of discuss more of this at the end with our questions and answers. All righty. Well, it seems like everyone did a great job with their pair deck. So we have another question for you is, and this one's a multiple choice, um, but how comfortable are you, you know, having discussions surrounding DEI? If you can let us know, that'd be great. Okay. Looks like we have a combo of slightly and very. Okay. Change your mind. All righty. Well, thank you all. And so speaking of comfort, this quote by the author, Jason Reynolds, he's an African-American author, if you're not familiar with him, um, he's been on the New York Times bestseller list, but we really love this quote. It's, you know, be not afraid of discomfort. If you can't put yourself in a situation where you are uncomfortable, then you will never grow. You will never change. You'll never learn. And we talk about, you know, this work isn't easy, right? you know, and it's meant to be hard and we're meant to be challenged and that's okay. You know, it's okay to be uncomfortable and, you know, it's what we do with that is what really matters and how we move on with it. Okay. As Kathy mentioned, um, sometimes we do hear within our department that um, staff are uncomfortable having these conversations or might not be sure the right words to say or feel like they're gonna say the wrong thing. Uh, we were hearing a lot of that in our early stages as a committee. So we decided to provide key terms within our trainings and work this in so that we have kind of common language within our department to utilize and be familiar with um, so that we know the key terms and we know the definitions and we keep, can keep building on these conversations for the future. So here are just a couple of the key terms that we've incorporated in some of our trainings. Um, I'm just gonna highlight some key points to them. I'm not gonna read them fully. So for diversity, we really wanna point out that diversity doesn't just mean racial diversity. There's a whole slew of things that make us as humans diverse. And you can see those um, written out in the definition. For diversity. So it encompasses all of those different identities, and that's how we shape our perspective on the world. For inclusion, um, I want to highlight how inclusion doesn't just mean that we're including people. Um, for example, for our EDI committee, we're not just including people from the Seacrest Studio and Music Therapy to be a well-rounded committee. Um, we are listening to their voices and we're incorporating their ideas. So it's not just child life led. This is a diverse committee made up of many different professions where we all put our voice together to have these goals and um, really make a change within the commit within the department. For intersectionality, that means um, two or more identities kind of combining to make a person. Um, it really, like for example, you could have a black female, you could have a white male, you could have a transgender female, and just being aware of how their identities 
come together to shape their view on the world, how others treat them, et cetera. And then for bias, the last um, word defined here, bias is a form of prejudice that is controllable and intentional. We're gonna talk a little bit later about implicit, implicit bias and you're gonna hear how that might differ. The next slide here um, is a great visual similar to that fence one that somebody had um, thought of when we're thinking about these terms. So this defines inequality, equality, equity, and justice. So while the visual is a great resource, it also might help to have an example. So I'm thinking of if we provided books to children, right? Inequality might be that we give one book to one child. The other child doesn't get a book. For equality, we'd be giving one book to each child, but one of these children gets a book that isn't in their language. So one is very accessible, the child can read it, and the other book is, isn't really that helpful. Say it doesn't have any visuals in it, it's just kind of useless. For equity, we are making an adjustment. We're addressing that inequality. So in this example, we'd be providing books in the children's languages to each of them. But as you can see, there's still more apples on one side of the tree. So maybe the child on the left is English speaking and we have a bunch of English books while the patient on the right might be Arabic speaking and we only have about three books to offer them. So justice, means that we're fixing the system. And that might mean that we have a plentiful, huge library full of a bunch of books in different languages to provide. So as we've engaged in this work, it's crucial really to locate oneself in the position of privilege and power that we each hold. Um, really that process of unpacking the invisible knapsack um, all those areas of potential harm or deficits in knowledge and empathy. Um, so this video right here, we can get it started. And it's a beautiful um, kind of illustration of what we've been. Ah, here we are. Thank you. Aged <laughs> in a global conversation about race and racism. You've probably had discussions at home, at school, or at work, and in those conversations, you've probably heard the term white privilege. You may have even had this term used in a way that felt like an insult or an accusation. Others will have told you that it's all just made up to make white people feel bad, and none of this is right. Privilege is a hard concept for people to understand, because normally when we talk of privilege, we imagine immediate unearned riches and tangible benefits for anyone who has it. But white privilege, and indeed all privilege, is actually more about the absence of inconvenience, the absence of an impediment or challenge. And as such, when you have it, you really don't notice it. But when it's absent, it affects everything you do. There are lots of types of privilege out there. The privilege of being born into a wealthy family versus a poor family is kind of obvious. But then there's the privilege of being able-bodied versus having or acquiring a disability that most of us take for granted. I have two very close friends who are wheelchair users, and I'll be honest, when I first met them, I was completely ignorant about the everyday ways their lives are made harder through no fault of their own. Some of these ways are simply thoughtless, but some of them are just the way we live, just the way we build infrastructure, just the way everything works that just makes their life harder than mine. That's just one of the ways that I'm privileged. And understanding that, embracing that, doesn't make me a bad person. But ignoring it raises the chance that my friends will be excluded in ways that are not obvious to me. And as their friend, I can't allow that. There's a good chance, as a white person watching this, your life is already hard. Every day you have to overcome some difficulty or challenge just to get by, but you can still have white privilege. White privilege doesn't mean you haven't worked hard or you don't deserve the success you've had. It doesn't mean that your life isn't hard or that you've never suffered. It simply means that your skin color has not been the cause of your hardship or suffering. There is nothing but a benefit to understanding our own privileges, white and otherwise. It brings us closer to those who are different. It helps us be vigilant about the ways we treat others 
different than us. It helps us make a society that is fairer and more equal. Having white privilege doesn't make your life easy, but understanding it can help you realize why some people's lives are harder than they should be. We've been engaged in a global conversation. We really, really like this, um, this example in this video. It, it brings up the kind of personal exploration of privilege, but we also felt in our committee that the exploration of like our professional um, uh, privileges as clinicians, we hold a lot of power in that as well. Um, so this kind of individual reflexivity and professional reflexivity has been a, kind of a key uh, a key um, point of interest in the in our committee work. Um, it's a very slow process, I think, to really get into what are the predominant um, privileges within our in our educational institutions, within our practice, within hospitals, etc. Um, so another starting point is our next slide, all about research. And so we kind of dove in. This is um, you know coming from so many different angles when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, you'll see a few child life research articles here, music therapy, and then generally what's happening in pediatrics. Um, there are so many different avenues of exploration to understand and go deeper into diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, really like the accountability towards um, equitable practice, and that, that being a responsibility that we each hold. Um, so you'll see a list of references at the end in case you're also interested in going down that path with us. Great, thanks, Eva. Um, so yes, and so we just wanted to make sure because I know we've been talking about some research and you know we're showing some good resources already. Um, but we just want to make it clear that we're not experts in this field, right? We're just a group of professionals who came together, who saw a need and felt, you know, we need to do more for our patients and families, you know, which then leads us actually to our clinical responsibility. Um, here at Boston Children's, the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion was founded in 2017, and that came out of the efforts of the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Council here at the hospital. Um, but there's a whole list we won't have, I don't have to go into them, you can read it, but a number of commitments that have been put forth by the hospital's EDI um, committees. And then also through our own for child life specialists, we have our code of ethics through our, the association of child life professionals and how we're really, you know, we're obligated, right, to maintain this environment that respects all varieties of diversity. Um, and then also, too, we have the American Music Therapy Association Code of Ethics. And I'm sure there are plenty of other, you know, professions who have the same because really it's the responsibility of all of us, no matter where we work, when you're working with children and families to really make sure that you're, you know, providing them that, you know, that environment where they do feel respected and they can feel comfortable. So as Daphne mentioned, we really kind of started this journey with our committee by recognizing the gaps when it comes to addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion within our institution and within our department. And in May 2020, as we all know, there was a really significant nationwide reckoning when it comes to these issues. And so that also further propelled some of the gaps that we had already recognized in our institution. And then in, you know, next month later, in July 2020, we formally pitched our idea of this committee to our child life director at Boston Children's. And then in August, we established our committee and held our first official committee meeting. Um, we really were proud of our work. By November, we had already created a book, movie, and TV list, um, including lots of multicultural and books in different languages and things that could be distributed to patients and families at our hospital. And then by January 2021, we launched an inclusivity kit and presented our work at our department-wide in-service. And we will explore some of these interventions further down in our presentation, but we just wanted to share the overall timeline of events. Um, by February 2021, we started a newsletter that gets shared monthly and is an intervention that continues through the present. 
In May, 2021, we had our hospital-wide bystander upstander training. In July, we presented to our leadership, which is all of our managers, all of our level two and level three child life specialists and our director. Um, and we led an implicit bias training. And then we also, it's kind of in between July and April. I know we have a little bit of a gap in our timeline here, but we also then led that with our department again. So we presented another in-service. And then now today we are here presenting um, our work to the larger Boston area community. And I think our goal of sharing this timeline with you all is that we recognize that, especially in May of 2020, there was a lot of momentum to address these issues, but um, we felt that, and we were seeing that, you know, there was a lot of momentum, but then it kind of tapered off. And our goal with our committee is to continue doing this work and making sure that our interventions are lasting and that we're conscious of these efforts in our everyday practice. Thank you, Amelia. Um, before we get into some of the interventions that Amelia mentioned in our timeline, I just want to give you a little bit of a better picture of what our department consists of. So right now, our department is, has a little over 100 positions ranging from child life specialists, music therapists, artists in residence, tech specialists, and employees in the resource room. So we have a wide range of professional disciplines within our department, which is a little bit more of a reason why we had to make sure that we had that common knowledge, we had that common language. And one um, of the very first ways that we did that was through staff education um, from in-services, which are staff-wide. So anybody can join them and they get PDUs for coming to them. So it was a great way to reach staff um, to provide them with some of the language and education. Something we were hearing quite often from staff was that they wanted really practical ways of what to say in different circumstances, what happens when you observe um, discrimination or microaggressions um, and or maybe you're on the receiving end and being able to kind of um, plan out some of those things um, in a way of like practicing almost like and so a very practical thing that was happening in our in our departmental in, in services but also the larger hospital-wide edi council um was rolling out something called um the bystander to upstander training and then also the microaggressions kind of uh, processing and um, kind of action um, action practice. Um, so these are some examples of different kind of avenues to take, whether um, depending on the role that you are in in that kind of um, situation. So maybe offering um, an alternative perspective and almost like de-escalation techniques here, um, speaking your truth and taking the chances for education with our colleagues or maybe with um, the responsibility to do this also with patients, um, finding common ground and giving yourself the time and space that you need. Um, again, kind of coming back to psychological safety and how to care for yourself if you are the recipient of microaggressions, setting boundaries as well, um, sometimes taking a stricter and firmer line when something um, really um, aggressive is occurring. And so continuing on with some of the um, interventions that we conducted with our department is we had people in our department, and we did this a couple of times. We did it once with our leadership group. We did it with our entire child life department. And then I actually did it with my own peer support group is um, we took an uh, implicit bias test. And if you go on to Project Implicit onto their website, there are a number of different tests. Project Implicit is... Um, it's a nonprofit that was actually founded in 1998 by a couple of scientists, but they are committed to advancing scientific knowledge about stereotypes, prejudices, and other group-based biases. Um, so as you can see, this is just a brief example of some of the various tests that you can take, um, but there's race, skin tone, religion, sexuality, age, gender. Um, so there's a number of different ones that you're able to take, and we did this with our department. And actually this next slide just kind of gives you a brief, um, just a little bit of a screenshot of what the test looks like. Um, the one that we conducted with the department was on race. And so basically what it is, it's a pretty quick test 
um, where you're given different categories. So there are categories for good and you were given certain words such as friend, excitement, delightful, or considered good. And then categories for words that were considered bad, pain, hatred, ugly. And then you had categories of, you know, black faces and then white faces. And then you were told, you know, like the screen on the right where it says gross, right? So then you would have to choose either you would press either the E key for bad or the I key for good. Um, and then like looking at the next slide, you had a picture of a black face, then you had to choose, you know, white person, black, you know, so and it really goes very quickly. Um, but it's really there to try to test, you know, our biases that we have, because we all have them. And we all lean, you know, one way or another. And then, you know, it's a great way just for us personally, and for people for all of us to kind of reflect if you haven't done an implicit bias test, you know, we strongly recommend that you do it and check it out. It takes maybe all of 10 minutes to do. Um, it's free, it's online. Um, but definitely kind of worth looking into. And it gives you a moment of pause to really look at, well, geez, what are my biases? Um, and our next slide, actually, we had, um, and we did a word cloud and we asked our staff to kind of, you know, just give us one word of, you know, reflection of how you thought, you know, what did you think of this test? And if you're familiar with word clouds, you know, the more word shows up, the bolder it is and the bigger it is. Um, so as you can see, one of those main words was anxious, right? You know, as people talk about it, it does go fast. And I think, you know, there was someone had commented, you, you know, that, you know, they, they didn't like it because, you know, or they, they took it again. And this time they did it slowly because they wanted to make sure they got the right answer, right? But that kind of defeats the purpose of you looking at your biases if you are taking it slowly. Um, so really, it was a it was a great exercise that we did with with our committee and with our, you know with our group within our committee and with our staff, and um, something that you know you can take back with you to you know your own workplace. Um, so back to our your pair deck, if you wouldn't mind, because um, we kind of talked a little bit about you know maybe some of the barriers for us. You know, people thinking it's too hard, it's too uncomfortable. Um, you know, we're not sure what to say. So if you can kind of let us know, you know, what are some of the barriers you've had to contend with, be it at work or school or just in your environment? People who get their backs up when they hear the word privilege, having diversity in the office, working with the majority of white coworkers, white colleagues, fear of accidentally saying the wrong thing, People feel that we talk about this too much. That's actually a good one. I think we've kind of come up with that ourselves um, and realizing that, you know, I think we have said before, these are ongoing conversations, right? This isn't a one and done type thing. Uh, worrying about saying something offensive without intending to, time to have a complete conversation. Um, not wanting the confrontation or misunderstanding, others being resistant to change thinking that the presence of a DI group is the preferred outcome rather than working towards dismantling white supremacy, lack of time, fear of being offensive. Well, thank you guys so much. I know we these are all great responses and we want to be able to go through them, but we also want to get through our, um, our presentation, but really appreciate you for sharing and, and putting yourselves out there because like you said before, we know this isn't easy. So thank you. So thanks everyone for your thoughtful responses. And so um, I think in recognizing some of those barriers, we also wanna recognize that there's many different approaches that we can take to this work. Some are on more of a micro level and some of these are kind of more on a bigger level. Um, so we're gonna share some of our multimodal approaches that we took on all these different levels and the slides to follow. But one of our approaches that we mentioned in our timeline is our monthly newsletter. So below are some examples of the newsletter that we had put out to our department that gets sent out every month. And um, we felt like this was something that was really accessible because it's something that our staff can read on their own time. And you know, some of them are, you know, there's podcasts or a recipe or a book to read. And um, you know, it's not something that's being forced on our department, but 
it's again a resource that we're providing them to you know increase their awareness to increase their education and understanding um and also just having those opportunities for them to explore that um in a way that can be on their own time and not in our larger settings of our department and services and things like that So another way that we did this was through our bulletin board. We call it a bulletin board, but it's actually a door in our child life office. But again, this is something that is accessible to everyone in our department. Um, a lot of people do come down to the office to you know, print or copy things and are down there. So it's something that they can take a look at while they're in the office. But again, it's not something that is being forced upon people in our department. It's something they can take and view on their own time. Um, and we try to change this up every month as well. All right, the next intervention that we wanted to share with you is our inclusivity kit. This was one of the first interventions that our committee created. We actually got funding from our department in order to get about 20 of these kits in the little tote bag out to different groups within the department. Um, just as a goal to further diversify our resources, um, you can see in this inclusivity kit, we have a doll, we have some books for different age groups. We have emoji blocks, which are different like emotions on their faces. You can see that encourages fine motor skills, um, a box of multicultural crayons with different skin colors, and then a family of little people. And while this inclusivity kit was focused mostly for on black families. We also continue to expand our inclusivity kit during Asian American and Pacific Islander month and um, pride month. So we've continued to give people more of these resources to diversify their playrooms or their um, location within the hospital. And we've got some really great feedback from staff. So on the right, you'll see a graph of which inclusivity kit items they've utilized most often. And I also wanted to know a couple interactions that have happened since we launched the inclusivity kits. So in one example, we were kind of just assembling these kits in a playroom and a nurse walked in and she asked like, oh, so these are cool. Are we only using them with black children and families? And we were like, definitely not. These are resources that should be and can be utilized with every patient and family that walks in the door. This isn't just meant for one type of person. Um, these are really just play items. And what might be unfamiliar is that they aren't white centered like many of our books and our dolls typically are. So it's a great way to start some of those conversations amongst staff. Um, in another example, a nurse had questioned one of the child life specialists for bringing a black baby doll to a child and asked like, oh, why do you always give this doll to the children or something along those lines? Um, but of course, we don't really get questioned about that when we bring a white doll into any patient's room. So just identifying these, these examples of how, how staff is can be receptive to this which with a little more education. Um, and it, it's really a great way to start conversations too amongst staff, especially because while these conversations might feel really lofty and really heavy, it's just a simple conversation about toys. So it can be a nice way to bridge that gap. So moving on, we are gonna see a couple more of our interventions. On the right, you're going to see bubbles that indicate which goals these interventions achieved. So whether these interventions circle one goal or all of the goals, it's just important to remember that no matter what intervention we're putting in place, they're all just helping more awareness for our committee, more awareness for this work in general. So this is our monthly calendar. I'm not sure if we've shared a little bit about this yet, but you can see in the middle picture that it's actually put on our bulletin board each month now. Um, it's one of our newest interventions. So it's basically a Google Doc, so everyone can add to it, everyone can access it at any time. And it was created because as a child life department, we're con constantly normalizing the environment for patients and families, which does include celebrating 
holidays and different milestones, even if they might look different in the hospital um, versus at home. So this monthly calendar allows us to just be aware of all the happenings each month. Um, it includes the specific day, the date, um, if a specific community practices this, any greetings, colors, symbols, songs um, that might be associated with this day. And then all the way at the end, there's a link that we can click on with more information. So each month it's on our bulletin board. And that might mean that you shift your practice a little bit, maybe to order some balloons ahead of time if a holiday is coming up or make special accommodations for a family that you know is of this faith. Um, so we will hear more later about how this has been received by our staff. Yeah, along the same lines, um, there was there is also a collective book and media list that is contributed by everybody in the department. Um, so adding a book book titles and a kind of description and you know like who that the narrative is kind of centering um, what are those key topics in the books and movies um, in a way allowing staff to have a, a quick guide and um and kind of like a, a touch point of saying oh like i want to diversify my next order a little bit more and have a bit more um a larger representation in materials so this is a really quick and easy um an easy thing to reference. And I believe next is also um, a, discuss a few slides on diversifying resources. In that same way, um, we recognize that by having the purchasing power um, as clinicians and the amount of money that's dedicated um, to hospital resources, we actually do have a lot of um, power um, over how what exactly the content is who where is the money going to and what um what businesses um are we allocating our funds to um so in that way um you can see that there's the a picture of some diversified books um the different balloons uh, that are referencing pride month um in more of the music oriented ways we work towards buying instruments that are also culturally representative um, considering that we have so many international patients, it really can be meaningful to see and play an instrument of um, various cultures. And also that's a beautiful um, place of education sometimes and just general um, exposure to new culture. Yeah, so these are a few more examples that we came up with here. Um, and just another example of having diverse resources that are representative of our patients and families that we serve, um, you know, whether it's our social stories and incentive charts for patients, um, you know, little sticker scenes and other materials like that. Um, never underestimating this. I mean, all of these resources are real examples that were shared with patients. And each time, like the joy and the smiles and the gratitude from the patients themselves and their families to say, wow, like that superhero looks just like me. I think that really speaks to these efforts and um, not to underestimate how small it is when a patient can see themselves in what we're providing them. And then next, we just wanted to showcase some of our hospital-wide initiatives at PCH. So up top, it says, you know, support health equity and racism. Those were actually magnets that the hospital put out and buttons. So you can wear them, you know, on your daily uniform or whatever. I have a fleece that I wear all the time. And so I would wear it on my fleece. Um, and then you have the different lanyards, you know, the rainbow lanyard for, you know, um, the LGBTQ and then the transgender specific um, supportive lanyard. And these are just a great way to say to families, you know, I see you and I support you without actually even having a conversation about it, but they see it. And then it just, I think, makes them feel more comfortable. Um, I know I, there was one time I have the, I wear my, ask me my pronoun buttons every day. It's attached to my ID. And um, I had a patient who uses, you know, they, their pronouns and she saw my button or they, sorry, saw my button and said, oh, what are your pronouns? And I said, oh, you know, she, her. And I said, well, what are your pronouns? She, and, you know, they said, you know, they, there. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, 
And I don't know if I wasn't wearing that button, if this person would have felt comfortable enough, you know, to say that and to share their pronouns with me. Um, so again, it's just a nice way to just, you know, without really having to have conversations if you don't need to, or don't feel like having certain conversations, but just letting families know that they're seen and, you know, supported. Okay. Um, now we're going to get into some of our goals that were more collaborative as a committee. So on the right, each color is associated with each action item. So it might be a little hard to see, but what you will see is that organizational integration and education have been the bulk of our intervention so far, just because we've been establishing ourselves as a fairly new committee within the department. Um, so let's jump into the social media post. We collaborated with the Child Life Department Social Media Committee in order to post some of our interventions on Facebook and also incorporate some of those holidays that we were talking about and make, make it more diverse of posts. Um, for the story hour with the Seacrest Studio, we collaborated with the Seacrest Studio team in order to get some of our books from the book and media list into Story Hour, which is a program that they run. For the Child Life Week video, we collaborated with the Child Life Month leaders in order to celebrate Child Life Month. We, we um, were able to share a video hospital-wide that included some of our efforts just to raise awareness of what we are trying to do as a committee. Um, as a committee, we do host many lunch and learns, whether we're talking about a TED Talk or an article and how that relates to um, our workplace. And then we've collaborated with the Child Life 101 Committee, who regularly runs informational sessions for students or aspiring child life specialists, so that we're not only reaching, um, reaching out to the schools that we typically would, but branching out to community colleges and local high schools and um, just more schools and places where we can try to attract them to the work of child life. Um, for EDI bystander upstander training, I think we have been over that a couple times. That's a hospital initiative. So we were able to advocate for our staff to get that training. For the child life services department competency each year, our department staff has to complete two competencies. Sometimes it's in regards to bereavement or um, working with behavioral health patients. So we were able to advocate last year for EDI to be one of those. So staff would either read an article or write a reflection on how they have achieved that. And then department goals. We have goals, I think up to like 10 years now as a department and EDI is really um, woven into each one of them. So we're consistently collaborating um, with our director in order to find out how we can better uh, work EDI practices into all of our goals as a department. Okay, so here we just wanna share how well each setting has equipped our staff for subjects of EDI. So we sent out a staff-wide poll about a month ago and these are the results that we got. You can see that educational training in Boston Children's Hospital has provided somewhat of uh, good education around these topics, but at the bottom, our EDI committee has equipped our staff very well, they feel, um, in discussions around these topics. This slide shows which interventions as a committee that we ran you through have been most helpful to our department. You'll see that the in-service has been most helpful potentially because that's staff-wide and that's where we form that common language. Second, you'll see the inclusivity kits. Um, next, you'll see the newsletters, which are a more relaxed way to engage in this work. And then our monthly calendar, which is somewhat surprising because as I shared, that was one of our newest interventions. So it seems like staff is really, um, is really liking some of those newer interventions as well. And this is a great way to measure it. I think as you can see, the bulletin board was probably the least um helpful and mm -hmm. we think a lot of that is we have you know staff who are 
and satellites or staff who don't always come to the office. I know I myself, I'm not down here very often. Um, so I think that was, you know, a lot of the reasons why people gave in terms of that one not being so helpful. Totally. And then we just want to hone in on the idea that Amelia shared before that this work is performative. It's not one and done. We're consistently making goals and trying to achieve them. So here are some of our future and ongoing goals. You can see here, I might just highlight a couple of them. On a macro level, we're trying to increase accessibility, diversity, and retention efforts amongst our Child Life Department staff. In the future, we hope to make an anti-racism guide so that patients and families can have access to that and have the resources to have discussions um, around diversity. We currently train our new staff and interns for our department. So we're hoping to open that up to volunteers in the future. Um, we're hoping to increase our education, staff education, multicultural music trainings. And in May, we're actually going to be achieving this last goal and presenting for the Association of Child Life Professionals at our national conference. So I know we've thrown a lot of different things at you all today throughout the course of this presentation. So we just want to hear if you can use that poll again to share with us what are some of your takeaways. Um, and then we can also have some time after this to answer a few questions as well. Okay, it looks like some people are gathering some good ideas. The giving tree image, yeah, we found that one a really powerful image as well. Yeah, again, echoing that it's not a one and done, that this work is continual and longitudinal. Great, there's some great responses here. All right, so we want to make sure to leave some time for some questions. We're going to take it to the next slide after reviewing a few of these. Yeah, the tools to respond to the microaggressions. Yeah, these are all some really thoughtful responses. So we're glad you all have some great takeaways. And these are just a few of our references. So we're gonna kind of skip through quickly so we have some time for questions. So here we are. So if you wanna either um, raise your hand and we can unmute you, or you can just type a question into the chat, um, we'd be happy to take some time to answer um, a few questions in our last six minutes or so of our presentation. And again, there's no poll for this one. So you can just use the um, chat feature directly as we did in the beginning when everyone was sharing their um, names and professions. Right, any specific questions? Uh, will the PowerPoint be, be available? Um, yeah, maybe some of the BU Wheelock folks can chime in here, but um, I do believe this session was recorded. So I think the PowerPoint will be available through that recorded session. And we are happy to share our, our PowerPoint as well separately. Yes, it looks like they will post the recording on the BUE Lock YouTube. So that is great for everyone's accessibility. It looks like we have about five minutes or so left if anyone has any final questions or thoughts. I see one question popping up in the Q&A asking, can you please talk more about how the inclusivity kit was used? Definitely can. Um, I think it was mostly geared towards child life specialists to put that in a playroom or just utilize it with patients and staff, um, patients and families. But um, the doll was used a lot for medical play, um, pretend play, um, arts and crafts with the crayons, more of that expression, fine motor skills with the emoji blocks, like I mentioned, uh, family engagement, reading books. Um, what else was in there? Yeah, and I think Ed, um, I think I wanted to add something. Oh yeah, I have a go go for it, Eva. Um, I actually don't have anything to add. I just wanted. I was just trying to <laughs> push that we were answering it. Yeah, I mean, I think it was something that we were recognizing, like a lot of 
some people more than others, maybe we're more conscious than other people on our staff of, of supplying those tools within their playrooms using their own budgets. So we really took it upon an initiative as our committee to make sure that everyone was conscious in utilizing these tools. But I think we use them a lot with, you know, play, preparation for procedures, you know, more therapeutic art activities with our patients and families. Great question. Are there any more? So there is another question in the chat. It says, has your team implemented any real-time feedback from patients and families, perhaps from the family advisory or teen advisory committees? Um, that's actually a great question. Um, we have not, you know, we haven't looked into that, but definitely maybe something for us to consider doing in the future. I do know that the hospital does, you know, their regular, was it the press gainy surveys and that type of thing, but we ourselves as a child life department haven't looked, you know, specifically in getting patient feedback. Um, I do know just from a personal standpoint, I hear all the time, um, cause I am, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm Latina and I do speak Spanish and I do get all the time how parents will say, oh my goodness, it's just so nice to have someone else who speaks our language. Um, and just the sense of relief that they get when I walk in the room and, you know, kind of start speaking to them and, you know, the language, you know, that they know. Um, but no, any like official feedback, we have not, but definitely something for us to look into. Thank you for that idea. It looks like another question came through. Any ideas you've implemented in the ER for DEI? Um, so we did have the inclusivity kit available to our ED child life specialists as well. So those materials were available for them to use. Um, and we kind of, they take part of all of our in-services and presentations as well. Um, so they're also encouraged to be a part of those and to be kind of implementing all the frameworks that we're giving them through there. Um, but I guess we would hope that our um, inclusivity kits could be used in the ED as well as the inpatient units, you know, um, to prepare a child for the procedure using that doll or to give a child who's waiting some of those multicultural crayons or other toys to play with. Um, so there's a question about how many of the child life specialists are bilingual and does WELOC still offer a child life degree? Um, I think there might be four child life specialists who are bilingual, English, Spanish speaking, um, right? Myself, Theo, Daniela, yeah. Milagros. Yeah. There might be a handful. Um, not as many, I don't think, as we would like. Um, and in terms of WELOC, so yeah, so there is through BU WELOC, there is a master's program in child life that's still um, still is still going strong and we do often our child life interns here at BCH do come from the BU WELOC program. I'm sure you can go on to the BU WELOC website to get a little more information. I think that might take us to four o'clock. So I think that is closing out our presentation. But we just want to thank everyone again for taking the time out of your day to join in this conversation and webinar with us.